The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next, radio and TV host Steve Arterburn opens up about the brokenness in his marriage. You know, uh, I was in a marriage for 20 years and there was uh, unfaithfulness. And when I found out about it and confronted her, she divorced me. I didn't forgive her instantly. I wanted to kill her. I mean, really, I didn't even know I had that in me. And then as I grieved, I was healing, and then I didn't want to kill her. I just wanted her to die, and I thought I was making progress. Today, I'm Randy Robinson. Sheila Walsh, as Hi. always. Good to have you. Mm -hmm. Nice to be here. We've got a great topic today because we're going to talk about healing. And Sheila, we all need a little healing at some point in our lives, somewhere down the line. I think probably at most points in our life. And yeah. I'm kind of grateful that that the person who's written 100 Days of Healing as a daily devotional is actually a really good friend of mine. Please yes. welcome Steve Arterburn. Thank you. Good to have you. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. I cheated a bit. I actually talked to Steve on the live cast that we do um, uh, at noon, Monday through Friday. And so we just had this conversation, so I know how good this conversation is going to mm. be. <laughs> when we had our pre-production meeting, we always sit and talk about our guests. And I'm going through the book, and I'm saying, wow, there's quite a lot in here about healing. And they said, read the cover. <laughs> 100 <laughs> days of healing. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, the thing that you tell a story, though, and I don't know if this was something you talked to Randy about, uh, but of an atheist who got healed who wasn't particularly thrilled. No, no, it's one of my favorite stories because a lot of people uh, think that God doesn't love them because they haven't been healed or they hear they had more faith. Well, this atheist that I met was in a hospice uh, with, with brain tumors, stage four cancer. They took him uh, for one final uh, MRI or CAT scan just to see how things were. And the doctor comes out and says, I don't know. You, you have no cancer. You are healed. Well, this was a, an angry atheist. He only had access to anger. He threw uh, one of these expensive pieces of equipment around the room. They sedated him. They had to restrain him. And a year later, he comes to Jesus. Oh, my gosh. So, I didn't know that. And he has, been, he has been serving. He's been serving wow. Christ for, um, I guess, 15 years now. Very committed a Christian. But I love the story because, you know, that was God's plan for him. Now you take someone like Johnny Erickson Tata, great faith, not the plan for physical healing and, and the chronic pain and all of that. But what I've tried to do here is take you on a 100 day journey using Bible promises for healing because we can't necessarily have a physical healing. But many times when we do some of the things the Bible tells us to do to heal, uh, it's pretty powerful. For instance, you know, James 5:16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you might be healed. Well, how many people are waiting for God to heal them, and yet they're so secretive. They've never told anybody about anything they've ever done. So if we would just do some of the things that the Bible tells us to do. You know, uh, Dean Ornish is this health food guy that got people eating food that tastes like hay. And, um, <laughs> and he says the most forgiving thing you could ever do is to forgive somebody that you're wow. bitter against. He said, that's far more healing of your body than any of the food that I have. And we just know that to be true. So I, I really believe that if we stop waiting for God to do mm -hmm. what maybe God's waiting for us to do, and we get on this 100-day journey, you might be pretty surprised at how much spiritual and emotional healing that yeah. sometimes even results in physical healing. Yeah, wow. well, one of the questions that I thought was very interesting from our conversation was this, this issue of, of confessing your sins to someone, but what if that confession does damage to another loved one, mm -hmm. another person? Yeah. In other words, I'm gonna confess my sins and in the process hurt someone else and now they need healing. How do we navigate those difficult waters? Well, it's interesting. We have to be use discretion. And uh, in recovery programs, we talk about making amends unless it would 
hurt somebody else, mm -hmm. we don't want to use that as an excuse. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you've been a sexual predator or have been a person with using pornography or unfaithful, when you confess that to your spouse, that is going to hurt them. Yeah. Yeah. But they are entitled to know mm -hmm. that that's the truth. And so uh, we always encourage people to do that with a third party. But we need to confess to somebody else first before we go confess to the person. We, we need to be open with somebody else that can help us through that. And then we can do a little bit of work and maybe that confession to the other person will be a, a more healing, less destructive right. uh, experience. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is the way that you link um, grieving to the whole forgiveness process. Because yeah. sometimes people kind of want you to rush to healing right. and rush to forgiveness. What, what do you see as the part of, of grieving? Well, a lot of people want to instantly forgive. And there is a concept of saying, okay, I, I forgive them, but there's work to be done beyond that. And, and I think in the Christian community, there's so many ungrieved losses. You know, let's don't just jump over here and say, I don't have any grieving to do because God wants me to forgive. I've lost something. I'm angry. I'm sad. You know, uh, I was in a marriage for 20 years and there was uh, unfaithfulness. And when I found out about it and confronted her, she divorced me. And, you know, I, I didn't forgive her instantly. I wanted to kill her. I mean, really, I didn't even know I had that in me. And then as I grieved, I was healing, and then I didn't want to kill her. I just wanted her to die. And I thought I was making progress here. And, what a beautiful and then, testimony. Yeah, yes. And then, you know, just some illness, that'd be okay. Um, but, but really, eventually, because I was honest about it, I found myself um, praying for good things for her because she was the mother mm. of my daughter. But I had people that helped me. Like on Sunday, uh, these couples that I ran around with before, they had this meeting called Couples and Steve. And, <laughs> and it was just so I could have a place to... <laughs> Be, be me, you know, they say, you're going to couples and Steve, you know, and, but it was so great to wow. have people not abandon me yeah. Yeah. What, and, and to help me to heal. So, but let me ask you, what's the proper way to, to grieve before we forgive as opposed to wishing someone would die? Yeah, right. Right. Well, I think, uh, to be honest, how you feel, first of all, you know, just say, okay, this is how I feel. I am angry. I have lost so much and, and my dreams. And one of, the, one of the things I had to deal with was just how much fear I had because I felt like, you know, I'll never have a ministry anymore and all of this. Wow. So it's just first being honest about it and then to be open. Some people, it's easier to be angry than sad. And mm -hmm. others, it's easier to be sad than angry. But the grief process... We, when we deal with that and express that, then I don't have to feel five years later like it just happened yesterday. And we all know people that oh, have yeah. had losses and you talk to them and it feels like, man, that is so fresh Still raw, 30 yeah. years ago. No, so they've got some grieving to do. But, you know, if I just tell you that here are problems, ungrieved losses or lack of forgiveness or people dealing with lust. If I just tell you that about the problem, all I do is add to your shame and your distance. But what I've tried to do here is say, hey, there's a path. And one of my favorite scriptures is Jeremiah 6, 16. And Jeremiah said, stop at the crossroads and look around. Find the old godly path, walk in those steps and you'll find perfect mm. peace and lasting peace. We need to stop mm -hmm. and look around. And, and that's what I've tried to help somebody do to find the areas of your life that need healing because a lot of people have a lot of stuff from childhood they've never fully healed from. And, and we want to say, oh, well, we're Christians. We just want to move on. Well, okay. But if, as you're moving on, you're dragging that with you, then you need to deal with that. Yeah. The way it's laid out here, though, I, I love this. I mean, I'm going to start using this for the next 100 days, so in case you thought it was your copy. You'll be a totally new know. person. I've got my own, actually. <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a scripture, there's a great devotion, and then you've got great quotes from, like, Henry Nouwen, Rick Warren, all sorts of people. And then for further reflection, I mean, this, is, this has got meat in it to and me. And it's real easy to use, and then there's scripture to, to go deeper. But the other thing I like to tell people is, you know, there's work to be done. Um, and, you know, my wife and I, after we got married, we discovered 
uh, we had a little difference in communication style, and this <laughs> didn't seem to come up while we were dating. And uh, I would, uh, if you, if I was a superhero, I would be bullet point man. You know, just tell me the facts and stuff. And she, women love that. Yeah, yeah. she would be more uh, Wonder Word woman. And when she communicates, you know, she kind of starts over here with a prelude, mm. and it kind of builds up, and there's a climactic moment, and then with then menu endo and postlude, and I'm over here with attention deficit disorder trying to hold on. And and so, you know, I can't relate at all. Huh? No, yeah. no. And so one day I, I wanted to talk to her about that, and I said, you know, there's just if there's anything you ever want me to work on, I'd be happy to. And and uh, but there was just something that's kind of just bothering me. Just give you three bullet points. And she right? said, okay, I've got something. I said, what? She said, something you could work on. I said, well, what? She said, I think you ought to work on me not needing to work on anything. And so I said, okay, well, <laughs> I'll do that right now. But we started working on our connection. And I'm going to tell you, if, rather than just say, this is the way I was brought up, or, you know, this is the mm -hmm. way we are, be humbled down. That's her term. Humble down mm -hmm. and come together as you are. And i got to tell you, we're having just the best days, best days of my life ever together and being in tune. We, we, we say it's like Bluetoothing up here. That's my son's little phrase for what we do. We can be <laughs> attuned to somebody, not mm -hmm. just connected. And so often we hear about horrible divorce rates and i i hate the the figure of how many christians are married and miserable and you don't have to be that you you can work through that, that's part of the healing process too. Yeah, you, you and your wife weren't always Bluetoothing it. No, you guys had some rough patches. We did, and in fact, um, we were with a marriage counselor. And, and how do you feel about Steve? She said, I don't feel anything. And and she said, How to me? How do you feel about her? I said, I don't feel anything either. And this really smart marriage counselor goes, Okay, well, we got something in common that we can <laughs> we can work on. You got, and and you know we, well. I might have a few too many shoes in my closet. And one day I came home from a trip and, and I told her I didn't buy these shoes. They were too much money. And, and then Thanksgiving I was going to preach and I, I said, you know, I can't get those shoes out of my head. You think maybe that could be an early Christmas present? She walked over to the closet. She had already ordered those shoes. She had them there for me. And that's the kind of person mm -hmm. she is. And I got to tell you, there were times she would have thrown the shoes at me, but she would have <laughs> never ordered them and given to me as a gift. So I just say, uh, maybe you don't have a good time with your spouse. We hated each other. I mean, that's where we were. And we are having the best days ever. So wow. don't give up yeah. hope and be willing to do some things maybe you never thought you'd need to do. I really think this book will help you. But one of the things... Um, We'll tell you how to get it in a minute, but I want to ask you, you're now a teaching pastor yes. in a church. What's oh. the church? It's called Northview Church in Carmel, Indiana. 13 campuses, third fastest growing church in America. Wow. Three of our campuses are in Indiana prisons. And uh, I have to tell you. Tell um, us about that. We, we went to the, I did a series called Take Your Life Back. And we, everybody in the church, we passed out over 3,000 copies of Take Your Life Back. And I met a guy there. And I said, how, how'd you end up here? It was a sex offender prison. He said, he was 26. I became a Christian. And the next morning I walked down to the police station. I turned myself in. I had been having sex with a 12 year old girl. Oh. I was raping a 12 year old girl. I said, I do not know of any, any other Christian man that would be that brave. He was mm -hmm. serving at least 15 years of a 30 year sentence. Well, Every Man's Battle just came out in the 20th anniversary edition. Fantastic that, yeah. book. That, Fantastic. That, that young a lot of man, man, he wanted to make a contribution. He took this book and he translated it into Braille and sent it to Library of Congress. And his edition is in Library of Congress, the Braille edition <laughs> oh of Every Man's God. Battle. Oh, my gosh. And it's just uh, stories of what God can do. Um, and, you know, the, I preached a few weeks ago. In our church after I preached that Sunday, 144 people came to Christ. 20 of them were in that sex offender prison. Now that, that's just, that's fabulous. yeah, that's what living's all about. It, it is. It's the greatest, you know, women of faith. We had 5 million women come. Uh, Steve is the founder of women of faith. But, and that God would use you is amazing to I, touch the and life. And we picked you and you, you. What didn't mean but, that? There was but, a, but hey, <laughs> but, here's, but here's the point. But what, the number that a lot of people, we had over a half million women come to Christ mm -hmm. with through women of faith. And okay. that's really the. Now, I know that uh, with the reboot of Ken Harrison's Promise Keepers, right. 
He just called you and asked you to that's be pretty, one of what, seven awesome. speakers? Seven speakers, and I'm getting to do the one on integrity, and I'm so thrilled. And we're going to be in Dallas yeah. July 31st, August, August the 1st, 1st, at big stadium yeah. here. Cowboys, the Cowboys, Jerry Cowboys. Yeah. And, um, What's you know, your message that day? Well, I'm going to talk about two things, uh, abortion and pornography. And they really go together because, you know, I was, I was exposed to pornography at four, and pornography causes us to objectify women. And when you objectify a woman when she's pregnant, it's just another object there. And they've asked me to bring men to repentance over being part of an abortion. And then secondly, help them to make God's standard, the standard of purity, their standard for their thought life. And, and really, I, I'm just I'm so looking forward to that day because every time... I give men a chance not just to feel bad about themselves, but here's the path right. to redemption. Right. Right. We get to see a lot of men change right. course. Can I ask you about that? Because w when we deal with some of these issues, especially like pornography, yeah. we get very legalistic about it a lot of times. And, and it almost, in a weird way, becomes more of a problem because we're focused on the problem all the time. Right. And just don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And right. that's all you're thinking about. What's the path to healing to where that that is not even an issue on your mind, in your life, and you are really healed from, from pornography or the pain of abortion? Yeah. You go from wanting to see things that stir up lust, as it says in 2 Timothy 2.22, to you want to protect yourself, your marriage, your relationship with God. And, and so you start to ask a question, is it pure? And, and, you know, the standard that Job set for us is not to have a hint of sexual immorality in your life. When you finally get your life cleaned up and you've confessed your sins and you're starting to put good things in your mind, not the other, then you're in a preservation process. Mm. It's just the opposite. You're, mm -hmm. you're saying, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to look at that because I don't want to mess this up. I want to honor my wife or my future wife or just honor me being a single. And, you know, my wife facilitates a group for women who struggle with pornography and lust and other things. And it's the same battle. It doesn't matter what your sex or gender is. But God has called us to put a foundation of truth, not feelings, and then the standard of purity. And uh, if it's pure, it's going to increase our relationship and depth with each other and with God. If it's not, it's going to erode it a little, by, a little by little. It just seems like it's time to shine the brightest light into the darkest corners of the church. Absolutely. We should be the people yeah. who are able to talk about anything. Well, you know, I was at a, a pastor's appreciation conference, and I was speaking, and, and I said to the guy that started, what's the problem? They go, oh, they don't want to offend anybody. Their churches. I said, we're the third fastest growing church, and because of our pastor, Steve Poe, we, we address the tough issues of abortion, divorce, mm -hmm. head on. That's how we grow. Right so much. And, and so I just want to encourage people to don't cover up, don't hide. And if you're, um, well, first of all, if you're in a church, make it a church where people feel, you know, God's rich in mercy. Be sure your church is rich in mercy and do something healing, like take some guys to promise keepers or, yes. you know, we do every man's battle workshop. Uh, come get your act together. Uh, don't just sit there and be mediocre or, and they'll, they'll put uh, on your tombstone, almost, or something like that. You don't want that. You want to live the life that God's called you to. I think that's a strong point, and I want to ask you personally. You have helped other men in their battles. You have helped people find healing. How much has helping others been a part of your healing? Oh, my goodness. I, 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 everything that I have been through whether it was paying for an abortion or a divorce or something. When I was in seminary in Fort Worth, I felt like God was calling me to be a revealer. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I've always been open about it. And then when someone else has come to me and said, because you talked about that, um, I was able to deal with it. My healing continues and I will never stop being amazed at what God can do with brokenness. Yeah. And I'm so grateful 
uh, that he has. He's a, he's a great redeemer and a great healer. Yes, he is. And this book, 100 Days of Healing, I'm serious, I love this book. Mm -hmm. It's really going to help you. And we'll tell you how you can get your own copy. But first of all, we want to take you to um, a place where Andy and I have both been and show you where there's some real needs for some real healing in different ways. Um, please watch this. In South Sudan, at this very moment, families' lives have been devastated by floods, followed by drought and civil conflict. The end result is food supplies have been depleted. These mothers have gathered this day so our medical teams can assess the severity of the malnutrition that is impacting their children. It's quite amazing as you walk in here and you just, you know, looking after mother after mother, child after child, you see how so many of these, these kids just kind of, there's a blankness in their eyes, there's a lethargicness, I mean, there's a quietness about them, there's a stillness about them, they look at you in your eyes and as they make eye contact you see that they're just lethargic. That's because they don't have food. We've spoken to these mothers, mother after mother tell us their biggest single challenge here is that they have no food. And that is why what is going on here is a crisis of epic proportion. And when we find this, we need you to react in an epic way. We need you to do something out of your heart that is as big as what this crisis is. Because without that, we're unable to meet these families' needs. We're unable to help these precious little children. And if we don't help them, they die. Yet another statistic, yet another child that dies because of malnutrition or starvation, to many of us, not a name, not a child we know, but to this mother and all the other mothers here, that child dies as a child with a name, their precious little baby, their little life that they would do anything for, just as you would do anything for your child. So please, I'm asking you today from the bottom of my heart, help us, help us to help these mothers. We're here but we can't do it without you. You know, the situation in South Sudan is absolutely desperate at the moment. These mothers and their children, they have been chased from their home. They have nowhere to go. And no matter where they go, they then discover that there's militia on the way and they are not safe. And you might be surprised looking at that, that some of these children don't look as malnourished as some of the children that we show you you know, when we were in Angola and the malnutrition clinics and those little ones are, are desperate. But what you need to understand is these little ones that you just saw in South Sudan, they're about four or five weeks away from that. Because if they have nothing, if they have no food, one of the things that we noticed with all the, the mothers that they were running away with everything they could carry, they had no food. When these children have nothing to eat day after day, and try to sleep at night with an empty belly. It's not a long walk between what you saw there and what we see when we go to the malnutrition clinics. That's why we want to intervene now and do something now, Randy. Yeah, you know, Sheila, for years we have been on the forefront wherever the need is, whether it's in South Sudan or other countries where uh, there's drought or famine. Life Outreach International has said, you know what, we are not just going to proclaim the love of God, we are going to demonstrate the love of God. We can only do that with your help. And that's why we like to come to you uh, during this time of year and say, you know what? $30 will help feed three children for three months. $100 will help feed 10 children for three months. $1,000, that's 100 children. You can do the math, it's very simple. But the important thing is that we come together and we do something. We reach out and we say, you know what? We are, Lord, your hands. We are your feet. We go to where the difficulty is. We extend that hand and there's something in that hand. And in this case, it's a bowl of food. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a lot of empty bowls. We need you to join with us to fill those bowls so that we can fill the stomachs of those children, so we can prevent the, the uh, malnutrition from setting in in some cases, or so we can turn it around in many cases and save lives. When you join with us today, go online, go to the phones, do what you can. There's no gift that's too large. There's no gift that's too small because it all 
puts food into the stomachs of children who will go hungry, likely starve. And, and I know, Sheila, you've seen it. I've been there. I've watched them die. I have watched children die in Africa. I don't ever want to do that again. So I will boldly come to you and say, do the best that you can. Let's save lives through mission feeding. Mission feeding began with a promise to be there in times of crisis for thousands of hurting and hungry children in their time of need. Now more than ever, we need your help to save lives by feeding and caring for children across the continent of Africa. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish our supplies to reach the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Your gift of love can be the miracle answer to a desperate mother's prayer. Call now with your life-saving gift of 30, 50, or $100 that will help feed and care for three, five, or 10 children for three full months. With your gift, we'll send you the Global Impact of Life Journal. This soft cover journal includes pictures from the mission field and inspiring scriptures as a reminder of your impact in giving to bless lives around the world. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Global Impact Bible. This English Standard Version presents a fascinating guide to the impact of the best-selling book of all time, filled with quotes from well-known figures, photographs, and reproductions of fine art. It highlights the many surprising ways Scripture has shaped civilization. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our commemorative bronze sculpture, A Mother's Strength. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. You know, like Steve said, I think a lot of times our healing begins when we reach out and help others. Yeah. And Sheila, that's what we're doing with Mission Feeding, and I think we can help them with this book. For any gift at all, we will send you 100 Days of Healing Daily Devotional. Also, 1-800-NEW-LIFE. That's where you can get in touch with Steve or newlife.com. Anybody that I meet on the road who's struggling, I send them to 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Thank you. Will you help me thank Steve Arterburn? Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Oh, great to be here. You so much. You guys keep it up. Awesome. Thank, you. thank you. We love you. We'll see you next time. Stay connected with Life Today through your favorite social media sites or visit lifetoday.org where life is always on. Regardless of your net worth, estate planning benefits you and your family. Do not put off this important step to peace of mind. Contact Life Planning Services today. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.